There are two ways to measure sea level, one from the ground and one using satellites. Gauges, like the one shown here, are in place around the world. These gauges measure sea level almost continuously. Using gauges, sea level is measured relative to a fixed point. Measurements from gauge stations around the world are averaged to get an estimate of the global average. The website here allows you to access gauge data. Follow this link and take a look at the data following the instructions on the slide. This slide shows changes in sea level rise over time using gauge data. The data goes back to 1880 and is based on 23 gauge stations shown by the colored lines. A three-year average is shown by the black line. Recent estimates of sea level rise using satellite data are shown in red. It is clear that sea level has increased over time. Also clear from the slope of the line is that the rate of change has increased from about 1.7 millimeters per year for the entire 20th century to three millimeters per year in the latter part of the 20th century. Starting in 1992, satellites were used to measure sea level. Radar altimeters send a microwave pulse to the ocean surface, and based on the return time, the ocean surface can be mapped as shown here. The ocean surface has a top topography of about two, mil two meters. This is an interesting example of using sea level to understand climatic events, such as El Nino. Here we see ocean topography during an El Nino event. Remember, during an El Nino, ocean waters flow back towards South America, resulting in higher sea level off the coast of South America. Here, white and red areas are 14 to 32 centimeters above normal, whereas purple areas are at least 18 centimeters below normal. This was the large El Nino event in 1997 that we talked about earlier. This is temporal data from different satellites beginning in 1992 to the present. The blue line is a 60-day smoothed average. Again, the data shows sea levels are rising at a rate of about 3.2 millimeters per year. This slide compiles gauge data and satellite data to estimate sea level change from 1993 to 2018. Dots show data from gauge stations. The stippled colors on the map show data from satellites. Although sea level rise is highly variable, almost everywhere shows sea level rise increasing. You can have fun and compare your um, compare results by playing with the interactive website on slide 28 to what the color of the dots show here. Okay, so we now know that sea levels are rising. What's causing it? Sea levels are rising today due to global warming. Global warming causes oceans to heat, which leads to thermal expansion and sea level rise. Also, warming is causing glacier ice to melt in the Arctic and Antarctic, which leads to sea level rise. Sea level rise in the geologic past has changed as well, partly due to tectonics and partly due to climate change. We can learn about future sea level rise by studying the past. But first we have to learn a few basics about how we measure sea level. Sea level rise can be an absolute or relative change. An absolute change in sea level is a global change, like what we've talked about so far. We refer to this as a eustatic change, and it often is related to climate change. But sea level can also occur relative to near nearby land at regional or local scales. This is usually caused by isostatic rebound or local tectonic changes. A nice example of isostatic local rebound, can, or a nice example of isostatic rebound can be seen in the Hudson Bay lowlands as pictured here. The trees show previous shorelines. During the last ice age, a massive body of ice covered Hudson Bay, which caused the Earth's crust to be pushed down. 
As the ice melted and the weight was removed, the land slowly rebounded. Sea levels in Hudson's Bay still appear to be falling, but they aren't. Really, the surrounding land is slowly rising, and up as with each incremental rise, a new shoreline is created, as shown by these trees. In order to determine past sea level changes, we have to be able to differentiate local from global change. The farther back in time you go, the more challenging this is. To determine past sea level change, we have to identify past shorelines and estimate their ages. Shorelines can be identified by geomorphological evidence as shown in the lower photo by the red arrow or by fossil evidence. Marine fossils indicate the location of ancient seas and the type of fossils um, can tell us about water depth. Using data from around the world, scientists have carefully reconstructed global sea levels over time. Scientists have reconstructed sea level fluctuations for the last 500 million years to the present. Um, there are two, uh, or sorry, three periods that are relatively recent periods um, that we'll take a closer look at. Uh, the mid-Pliocene warm period, the last interglacial, and the end of the last glacial maximum. These should provide us with knowledge to better understand future sea level change. The mid-Pliocene warm period occurred 5.3 to 2.6 million years ago when carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere were similar to what they are today. This plot shows atmospheric CO2 concentrations on the x-axis and sea level on the y-axis. The different colored symbols indicate different geologic periods. Points for the Pliocene are represented by gray diamonds. The concentration of CO2 during this time was about 280 to 400 parts per million, very similar to today. Given the similar CO2 concentrations, you might expect sea level to be similar, but they weren't. They were 20 to 23 meters greater than today. The higher sea levels were mostly the result of melting of Antarctic glacier ice. We can also look at the last interglacial period that occurred about 125,000 years ago. Remember, we talked about the last interglacial period when we looked at Bill Ruddeman's um, data last week. The IPCC reports that during the last interglacial salt sea level was very likely 6.6 .6 meters higher than today. Hmm, this is interesting. <laughs> 